thought you might like to see a picture of the kind of kimonos they used to wear in the old days. Can you imagine? You just wear one. Look, she must be wearing at least 12 kimonos. 12? Yeah. Would you like to have 12 kimonos? No. No. You look very funny out on the jungle gym with 12 kimonos on. What do you think they're doing? You think they're just standing there? Or what? They're looking, they're looking at something. Can you find it? That? Yeah, little kitty. It's almost, you almost can't see it there. And how would you like to wear your hair that way? Yeah, sort of. Sort of? Oh. But do you think Mama's prettier than she is? No, I like Mama the way she is. You like Mama the way she is? Me too. Listen, why don't you go back and ask her if she'll play the koto for us a little later, okay? The expression made in Japan has lost much of its old connotations in recent years. It's become frequently a sign of rare quality. In art, it has always been synonymous with excellence. Japanese woodblock prints are but one aspect of Japanese art. They are esteemed for themselves and for the extraordinary influence which they've had on the course of modern art. They are often delicate in design. They're always delicate in materials. And that's why this and all the other prints we are showing on this program are woodcut reproductions. Many of the originals are in the great collection of this museum. This one is by Kiyonaga. It's one of the central, he's one of the central figures in printmaking, and we'll return to him later. It's a looking back, a nostalgic evocation of Japan's classic period of refinement in art, the later Heian period of the 10th to 12th centuries. But the Japanese print developed in a vastly different world than this one of court ladies adrift in a dozen kimonos and gallant princes who judged them by the elegance of their calligraphy. This is its proper setting, or improper, depending on your point of view, in a 17th century house in Yoshiwara, the courtesan district or licensed quarter of Edo which is now called Tokyo. A guest at the left peeks through a hole in a screen at one of the milder diversions, two couples engaged in a variation of the old scissors, paper, stone game, while a group in the back room attends to the twang of a three-string shamisen. It's called a perspective print because the artist takes delight in creating the sort of illusory space which the Japanese had seen in engravings brought in by Dutch traders. It's one of the early hand-colored prints in which only the key block of the black lines is printed. A Japanese writer of the period summed up the philosophy pretty well when he wrote, living only for the moment, turning our full attention to the pleasures of the moon, the snow, the cherry blossoms and the maple leaves, singing songs, drinking wine, and diverting ourselves just in floating. Floating, caring not a whit for the pauperism staring us in the face, refusing to be disheartened, like a gourd floating along with the river current. This is what we call the floating world. That's a 17th century writer named Asai Ryoi. The word he used for this fleeting, floating world was ukiyo, and e means picture, thus the name for prints and paintings in this style, ukiyo-e, pictures of the floating world. It was the popular art of the Edo period from 1600 to roughly the middle of the 19th century, when the feudal government resided in Edo while the emperor remained a mere figurehead in Kyoto. Its first known master was a man named Moronobu. He was a painter. He did this scene of two lovers frolicking in the flowers in simple black and white. The one on the right is the man. You can see part of his head has been shaved. He's left his sword leaning against a tree, and that's symbolic in a funny way. The Japanese had isolated themselves from foreign conflicts and wars to, so as to get to know one another better, to consolidate and centralize the power of the, of the petty feudal lords and increased interior trade poured money into Edo and gave rise to a bustling, pleasure-loving new middle class which demanded 
this kind of art. It began with ukiyo-e paintings of everyday life, and of course most ukiyo -e artists considered themselves painters first, and book illustration developed, and when the demand for ukiyo -e prints came along, they, the painters combined with the Japanese woodblock carvers, highly skilled after 400 years of printing and illustration of Buddhist texts and the Chinese classics. This one is the frontispiece to an album of what connoisseurs would call erotica and the post office would call pornography. Whether the conspicuous indulgence in sex and its imaginative depiction in art which marked the period are more reprehensible in some bizarre manifestations in our enlightened culture is happily irrelevant here. Art always contains a, a moral judgment by statement or omission, and we don't need to share it to enjoy the eloquence with which it is revealed. Color printing took a while to appear. This is a hand-colored illustration by Sugimura Jihei, showing the hero of Japanese history, Yoshitsune, serenading a famous beauty, while perched rather precariously on a bullock. The line is here fairly characterless, the color that's dominant. You see how the tree is strategically placed in the middle where the fold of the album was. Some of the early work that I respond to most enthusiastically myself was made by the Kaigetsudo school. The school derived from the master painter Kaigetsudo Ando, whose pupils as well as descendants inherited his name in this custom which often causes difficulties of attribution. His successful career as a painter, as the painter of the beauties of Edo, was cut short and he was exiled for his involvement in a characteristic scandal of the period. A principal lady-in-waiting at the shogun's court was discovered in an affair with a man in a very shady profession. He was an actor in the new kabuki theater. This one is by Kaigetsudo Dohan, and it was one of the most famous pinups of its day. We can see here how a painting style is being transcribed into prints beginning to be conscious of its own character, the, the undulating line cut sharply in the resisting wood, marvelous bold vigor of that kimono, those lines that swoop and swirl, and they contrast with the delicate creature inside. It was revealed just by that little head the ideal of beauty takes a while to get used to. It's, it's related in some ways to the ideal of, of the ancient Chinese court and to the ideal conceptions of the Buddha, which had developed over the centuries. By the time Tori Kiyonobu began his great series of actor prints, the Kabuki Theater was already assembling a violently colorful history. His style was brilliantly suited to the extravagantly stylized realism of the plays that dealt often with themes of knightly valor and devotion. His strength was in the dramatic tension with which he electrified his characters. And it's even been suggested that this kind of work perhaps influenced the style of the acting. Above the actors' portraits are their family crests, the house crests. And these actor prints, is, they really had as many female collectors as the courtesan prints had among the men. Okumura Masanobu was one of those artists who, by their personal genius, expand the entire style, the subject matter, and the technical range of an art. In the first half of the 18th century, he tackled everything from Buddhist subjects to kabuki, scenes from classical, modern literature and legend, birds, flowers, animals, landscapes, courtesans the festivals and sites of Edo. He was also a writer, and his prints often contain literary puns and allusions which are lost unless we know the source and the language. It's probably just as well that we can't translate the poem on the curtain. It's decorated with a pillow. This couple really belonged to a floating world, their kimonos billowing like waves. Of course, the kimono, kimono was justly appreciated as a work of art in itself. These prints often served as fashion plates. This 
lovely girl strolling among the plum blossoms is a man. The authorities found the performances of the women in early kabuki a little too exuberant and had them replaced by fair young men as on the Elizabethan stage of Shakespeare, and that created other problems. So they ordained that the women be played by mature men, and so we have the institution of onagata, the female impersonators of the kabuki stage. This takes a bit of getting used to, too, but devotees of the kabuki learn to accept it as just another convention. And she's a little more convincing here than on stage, for the artist has simply envisioned an ideal feminine beauty. It's a theater souvenir after a performance by Nakamura Senya. We see on his sleeve the, the house crest, the ginkgo leaf. This print is by Kiyomasu the First. Kiyomasu the Second was not, I think, as fine an artist, but here is one of his better prints of the most famous actor of the 18th century, Ichikawa Danjiro II, who was greater than Danjiro I. The Ichikawa rice measure crest of concentric squares adds a striking pattern to many kabuki prints. And this is the most dramatic moment in a famous play called Shibaraku, which means wait a moment. The Superman hero appears for the first time in the rear of the audience, and he calls out to halt an act of treason. Once, when Danjiro made his entrance and shouted, Shibaraku, a jealous actor on stage decided to spoil the entrance by not picking up the cue. And Danjiro kept shouting it until he was red in the face. The audience loved it, and that's the way it's still played in Tokyo today. A primitive form of color printing began to replace the hand-colored prints around this time. And a work like this, Girls at Fukugawa, by Kiyomitsu, excuse me, has two colors, an earth green and a vermilion faded to pink. And they're printed on top, or printed after, the initial ink print of the outline. And within that limitation, the extraordinarily rich effects were obtained. We have a an original key block here. It's very economically made. There are four different prints on it by three different artists. And we have a print that was taken from this block by Mr. Iguchi of the museum staff. It's a scene from the kabuki, a girl holding up a robe, which a writer has just decorated with a poem. Because of the ambiguity of the written language, the Japanese take a joycy and delight in word plays. This one can be read, the fortress of Koromo has fallen, or the cords of the kimono are broken. From this simple technique, there now gradually evolved a, an elaborate process of full color printing. The man who gets most of the credit for it was Suzuki Haranobu. Before we look at his work, it might be well to examine the method of production, which had developed now. It began usually with the publisher or connoisseur who commissioned the work, frequently suggesting the subject, sometimes even the general design. He also put up the money, supervised production details. The artists came next with a finished ink drawing of the final design on which everything else rested. Then the engraver who cut a cherry wood block for the ink outline, and then the color block, sometimes allowing for several colors on one block. The printer came last with the job of printing them all in perfect register on superb handmade paper, usually guided in color selection by the artist. This is one of the richly textured results which made Harunobu world famous, the Kagiya Tea House. On the left, a young rake, as they always describe them in art books, dallies with a reluctant waitress outside the tea house, while some lovely prospective customers seem to be eyeing each other's kimonos. Behind a post, a child carries a sprig of cherry blossoms. The Harunobu ideal of feminine beauty created a new sensation, a, a frail, poignant creature who looks as though she might drift away like a leaf in the wind. She makes an interesting contrast with the snub-nosed, plainly-dressed woman who is seated preparing tea and cakes, but 
even she is, is endowed with a, a limpid, flowing grace in her pose. And those tiny little hands seem no more fit for labor. Haranobu was a, a master of the oblique, unexpected view. See how we're looking down on this scene. He knew how to exploit supremely well the, the play of the languorous curves of, of the kimono against the geometric e exposed structural elements of Japanese architecture. This one shows ostensibly a sporting young couple whose rousing game of battledore and shuttlecock, this was something like netless badminton, is suspended so that the shuttlecock can be retrived, retrieved. It's actually a subtly ambiguous illustration for a poem, which normally is printed in that cloud form at the top. As fast the Mina stream down, down Mount Tsukuba to fall into deep pools there to be caught. So love profound holds me in thrall. And I'm sure it's much prettier in Japanese. His work is Harunobu is, is justly known as one of the peaks of ukiyo-e. Collectors often cherish with even deeper affection artists that are not as well known, such as Ipitsusai Buncho. He was overshadowed much of his lifetime by Harunobu. This lovely lady is again nominally a kabuki actor, but the print is a magnificent evocation of feminine grace. She walks in, in the garden by night past a sprinkle of chrysanthemums. Some Japanese names are difficult, but they improved on that one. They call them kiku. She's derived from Haranobu's ideal, but Buncho's ladies are marked with a special somber dignity, the color limited and restrained with that shibui character of much Japanese art. It doesn't ask to be liked, but only to be discovered. We are, of course, omitting many distinguished artists in this casual survey, but we can't overlook the last great artist of the Tori line, which began with Kiyonobu. That is, Tori Kiyonaga, who did the first print we looked at of the court ladies. He's particularly well represented in this museum. The courtesan by the window is gazing out over a moonlit Shinagawa Bay with its flickering lights of fishing boats. Dr. Ernest Fenelosa once wrote glowingly of this print, the lines, too, falling from the standing figure and then curling into the crouching girls upon the floor are more harmonious than Botticelli, more suave and flowing than Greek painting, and indeed suggest the finest line feeling of Chinese Buddhist painting and even Greek sculpture. There is, in those words, the fervor of a great scholar devoted to making a distant exotic art accessible to the West by measuring what are perhaps immeasurable things. But this print gains a, a strong hold over you as, as you look at it. There's a sort of innocent majesty and very uninnocent surroundings. The bars of the window take on a, a prison look. Without sentimentality, we become engaged in the fate of these three splendidly wistful creatures, as vulnerable to chance as the folds of their kimonos. This print by Kiyonaga is called Sudden Shower at the Mimeguri Shrine. At the gate, a group takes shelter. A samurai wipes his head with a towel while another man folds his cloak. A lady looks anxiously at the sky while her maid fixes her obi. But there's rescue on the way from the Nakadaya restaurant advertised on the umbrella. She's carrying two umbrellas and a pair of rain clogs like her own. She's followed by a, a running geisha with her face wrapped in a towel, a rice field in the background. And then there are two married women sharing one umbrella, followed by a last geisha whose obi and poise have come undone. Above the clouds, a group of humorous thunder gods in ordinary human clothes are having a conference concerning a poem. If thou art indeed God who watchest over farmers, Send forth, I pray, showers. Now we come to the great mystery man of ukiyo -e. 
we know that he, just a few things out of, out of history about him, that he designed portraits of kabuki actors and was criticized for attempting to achieve an extreme of, of realism and therefore he was not long in demand. And that he was recorded as being a no actor in the service of the Lord of Awa. But that's all that is known about him. It's all that was ever recorded. And uh, historians wish that uh, they'd recorded a little bit more. He's a dramatic artist. His, his realism included a great deal of a wit also, witty exaggeration. This is the great character actor Ichikawa Ebizo. There's some question as to what role he's playing here. The conventions of the kabuki hairstyle tell us that he's portraying a villain of not too exalted station. Shiraku's figures bulge out and almost burst the confines of the picture. He takes us beyond the pageantry to the actor playing a role to the hilt. And then beyond the role, he t helps us to see the actor as a a gifted, extroverted human being with human quirks. The simple looped line with which he gives the character to that mouth is something that Toulouse Trek would well have admired. It's been said that Shiraku was the only ukiyo-e artist who portrayed the female impersonators of Kabuki without any illusion that they might be girls. In this role, the actor was playing a beautiful courtesan who avenges the murder of her father. Judging by Shiraku's portrait, it must have been a summit of the art of acting. This actor is portraying a yako, a manservant of a type often used by samurai masters, at least on the stage, to perform deeds of violence. He lurches into our consciousness with a fierce growl, his eyes crossed in dark malevolence, completely theatrical, but frightening anyway, starkly designed against a, a simple dark mica ground. Beautiful women were a cause for celebration in art and poetry, wherever they were found. Utamaro is perhaps best known in the Western world for portrayals like this one of a famous tea house waitress named Okita. She was the subject of many prints and of this testimonial by a satisfied tourist. Written while resting at Naniwaya, anyone who goes near it is just as sure to stop at the famous tea house to look at the pretty waitress as they are to stop at the post station and harbor for which it was named. Utamaro was a prodigious producer of erotica, but we have here a glimpse of a domestic side of Utamaro, a mother examining a bolt of silk, and it's really marvelous the way he's suggested the transparency. And below, there is a bald and, I find, slightly sinister little child playing with a fan. But look, look how he puts, how he varies the thickness of that line, how it is a strong bending, bending around the mother's knee and so thin and delicate for the child's body. This is absolutely one of the worst prints in the history of ukiyo-e. The waves are static and ridiculous. The design is clumsy and dull, but the artist persevered, and one day he made another great wave. And it is probably the most famous ukiyo-e print ever produced. Hokusai was a phenomenal figure who did just about everything in art. Died at the age of 89, saying that if he had 10 more years, he might have been a great artist. He stands at the end of the great days of ukiyo-e with another giant, Hiroshige who did this painting, this print, we've been looking for it for years, it has the ideal dimensions for television. The, key, the chief contribution to ukiyo-e of the genius of Hokusai and Hiroshige was in landscape. And we thought their mood might be echoed by the music of the koto in an ancient composition called Rokudan, played by my wife. Toshiko?